Welcome to my talk, everybody. Thanks for that massive and also curious audience. My name is Johannes Landsdorfer. I work at IXDS as a design lead for about eight years now. And in case you don't know, IXDS is a design agency based in Germany. About two years ago, we started a new focus area that we called um, smart manufacturing and that contains in large part um, industrial production. And um, when it comes to industrial production, most of my colleagues, but also clients say, that's interesting, but what's design got to do with that? Why of all disciplines do designers now have to stumble through the factories? And can it actually be interesting? And maybe at this point I have to confess that I have a special preference for complex systems and the really nerdy stuff. I can get excited about network security management dashboards. So that might be special, but I think it's still interesting. And on the other, on the other side, we can also see that we can transfer a lot of the knowledge that we gain from other industries and combine it with um, the challenges that we see in smart manufacturing. Just uh, think of a smart home environment and a smart factory. So there might be something to transfer. But um, let's look closer and meet the user. This is how my usual user looks like. And as you can see, there's a man. The white thing next to him is a machine. And in front of him, you can also see the orange thing is um, an interface. So you have man-machine interface. And that's a pretty obvious design case already, I'd say. But um, traditional interface design might, might stop there and think about the arrangement of the buttons and the ergonomics, and that's all necessary, still very necessary, actually, and also worthwhile. But especially you being service designers, we have a broader look. And we also look at um, the machine itself. The man during his day will also operate the machine. He will handle material. Um, he will use these measurement instruments uh, here in front in front of him, and he will certainly also use these orange kites in the back. And these orange kites, they determine very much the, um, the, the parts that he will be producing throughout the day. Will, they will also determine what material he needs to order and all these sorts of things, and they also indicate to him whether everything is running smoothly. So these kites are, have, a, have a tremendous impact on his user experience. And there are also artifacts of a larger factory-wide um, logistics systems. But not only um, are we looking at a factory as a system, of course, also process engineers do. And they have also developed their own sign language for it. It looks like this. So you have machines, in case you can't see them, that are the black boxes. You have suppliers moving in with their trucks, bringing in new material. You also see that everything is connected to a computer system um, with the arrows that are everywhere. This is actually a process engineer's equivalent to a service blueprint. So we sort of have to learn the language, but there is something. The only thing that this map is not really good at is showing what the people are doing. Now, when it comes to building a new machine, for example, then you might have mechanical engineers doing the machine design, they might not talk so much to the software engineers taking care of the software system behind that because there are different departments. And they might also not talk so much to the process engineers who determine the task for the people on the shop floor. And if it gets really bad, none of them ever talks to the user, to the worker on the shop floor. And then one day, the system gets rolled out, it hits the shop floor, and if any of the assumptions that these people were having was wrong, it can end up in a big disaster. Not only frustrating all the users, but also costing a lot of money. So that was a point where I thought designers are not only, they cannot only work in an industrial environment, they are really needed there. But the factory of today is also rapidly changing. It's getting more and more networked. The material and the machine, they are all start, uh, supposed to, to communicate in an effort that's called 
industrial internet or um, industry 4.0, if anyone, by the way, who has heard the, the term industry 4.0? <laughs> so it, at least some, um, it's actually, I think it's a, it's a German term as well, but anyway. So um, this effort is, is um, thought to, to link the machines and uh, also external suppliers, all processes closer together so that the processes become more efficient and also more flexible at the same time. But um, as all the systems are now um, making interdependent decisions, this also adds a whole level, a whole new level of complexity to the system, but also to the users. And I think that uh, service design can make a big contribution in coping with this complexity, in producing better workplaces, and also helping the uh, companies involved to innovate. And based on the experience that we made over the last two years, I put together some thoughts or hypotheses that I briefly want to go through with you. I think, or we see a move from machines to platforms. I think we need to go from the nowadays rather stealthy algorithms to transparent systems. We see very much rigid interfaces, but they need to promote a much more natural collaboration of human and machine. And we can also move from scheduling to a more self-organized form of work. We've been, I guess most of you have been talking about um, platforms and that we move from products to platforms um, sometime already now. But it's not just that we move from products to platforms, but even from production to platforms. The machines today, they are super efficient already. They are super fast. In this case, you see a signature machine, um, a, a laser cutter to pro process sheet metal. So it's really advanced and like futuristic um, technology, you could say. And uh, this is, in this case, built by a company called Trumpf, um, which plays an important role in this case because uh, Trumpf is one of the manufacturers who discovered that making faster machines, what was their, their main asset so far, it doesn't make their customers any more productive because it's the steps between the, the, the processing that makes the overall system run slow, like um, getting orders in and um, getting material from one place to the other. And so um, they decided that they have to build um, not machines anymore, but to turn into a software company. They did so um, first with a startup to have separate businesses. It's called Exum. And they have a platform um, that organizes and optimizes all the processes um, that occur in a typical sheet metal processing plant. And they did not only um, make it so that their machines are better connected, and if you have all the machines from them, then it will be a perfect system, but they realized that their clients will have all sorts of manufacturers um, in their manufacturing hall. So they needed, or they understood that they need to open up their platform um, for other partners that you can see up there, and even for some who might be their competitors just to have a comprehensive system that is accepted by the clients. This is for the designers now the design challenge. How can we make um, this system or how can we make the individual services here work together and how can we make the benefits visible to all the connected partners to strengthen their motivation and their contribution? Second reason is or a second design task, make the invisible visible again. So that's pretty classic. But um, if you look at machines today, they are more and more networked. They are connected to computer systems, so they um, are governed by more or less autonomous algorithms today even. And they determine very much um, what needs to happen in the factory, and the worker might just on the on the shop floor. They might just um, might just get the display below here. So um, it's in German, unfortunately, but it's, it just tells them um, where to pick up things and where to drop them off. 
And all the rest, all the, the, the reasoning behind it is, is very much invisible, where in fact um, this worker is performing a role, um, as you can see on the top right, um, in a complex logistic system. And how much better could this person use his or her intelligence and experience if they had a better overview over the system or the current system status? They are also usually the first ones um, to recognize when something goes wrong because there's always something that goes wrong. And they are like the, the sensors of, the, or they could be the sensors of the system. One of the examples a little bit more in, into the future that is happening right now in factories already is um, uh, augmented reality technology that can be a very good uh, means to transfer, uh, to, to transport the, or to, to provide contextual information in the workplace, like literally on demand and also on the go. And that can be a smart way to deal with the large amount of information that is available. Machines are precise and tireless, but also humans have the unique um, qualities such as uh, creativity, creative problem solving, um, experience, even emotions and affection. But um, today, effort, uh, uh, workers have to use a lot of effort to document their actions and to make them available to the, to the system. And they also have a hard time documenting their knowledge and, and um, transferring it to the, to the system so that it becomes part of um, of the um, improvement process. And I think that um, the Internet of Things can be a very good technology supporting that. In this example, we can see the Pro Glove that has recently launched. It's a glove um, that has motion control and an RFID reader and a display literally at the worker's fingertips. And this makes the worker's action much more readable to a machine. And that reduces then the necessity for manual interaction. Or, yeah. During our um, um, observations that we had in the um, uh, factories, we also often found that there are very experienced workers who start or who work ahead of their schedule because they are so fast already and then they start helping other people uh, away from their position and that was heavily criticized by the process engineers because they said the, the, the system is not designed that way it's not so, supposed to happen and the workers were sort of hacking the process and um, in, uh, when, we, when we went deeper into the discussions um, we found out that it's not actually so much the problem that they were helping others, and it was like forbidden, but um, that they were making a, a, the system run very smoothly while it was in effect inefficient, and their supervisors were not able to see these inefficiencies anymore, and they couldn't improve the system. So obviously, um, I think none of both parties is to blame in this case, but the, the system in between, the computer systems, um, failed to connect the dots to transmit the necessary information between the one people um, finding the, the inefficiencies and the other people um, doing something and, and about it and, and improving the overall system. The last point is I think we can help individuals much more to shape the way they work. A networked workplace with some algorithmic support can allow for much more freedom in how to organize work. And that's, of course, very easy for us uh, as we are like digital knowledge workers, but it can also improve um, the complicated shift planning in a factory. I think designed right is an important point here because if you deeply integrate man and data and machine, you can also very quickly use that to severely um, to impose a severe um, surveillance of all the worker, and that would stifle all the benefits that I was talking about so far. If you think about um, how uh, a team having a, a shared goal and striving um, to a, a, a shared goal and, and how that produces the right um, intentions, 
There's a good example um, from France um, called Favi. And that's actually a very traditional metal foundry. So you could say, or you would, you would suspect that they are very um, conservative, but it's quite the opposite. They are sort of an avant-garde um, regarding the, the organization of their workers. It's built around the belief that people are good. That means if they have the right tools, they will come up with the best solutions themselves without a lot of steering from management. So they have barely any management um, around. So I briefly want to um, sum that up. Um, this is um, where the four, four points I was um, talking about so far. And I think we see a different level of adoption there. Um, for example, um, platforms are built everywhere at the moment. But um, I have the impression that few really know what they want to do there and how this will improve their business. The stealthy algorithm, uh, the, the, the visualization and um, uh, interface problem, that is a lot of hard work because you need to find specific solutions for the users. But this will be something that affects the workers directly. It has the biggest um, concrete impact. And maybe the most complicated one is the um, self-organization, because this is something that is not at the core a technical question, but this really requires a shift in the mindset. Now, let's think about it on a different level. Maybe you, you think, well, while you hear that, is that really worth the effort? Is it worth looking at um, the, the users in the industrial process while we see at the horizon already that the factory of the future will consist of computers and machines alone. Won't the factory of the machine, uh, won't the factory of the future look like this? Lights out. No lights required anymore because there is no human around. All the machines and computers um, working in a seamless process, even optimizing themselves, and then with all the human jobs gone, how would that affect our society where factories are not just a source of income for many, but they are also a source of identity? Would it even change the relation that we have to products when um, these are manufactured with all, without any human intervention? I think I personally think that removing the human from production is not the path to the next level of manufacturing. But I'm thrilled very much by the thought that Aristotle already had. So that was way before even Industry 1.0. That we can hand off all the hard work to machines and then we can concentrate on philosophy, on improving ourselves to become better humans. Thank you.